Today we are going to be in the book of Ephesians, some in chapter 1, some in chapter 2, because we're going to be looking at the topic of how Jesus' death equals your forgiveness. You can follow along if you want um, in the message notes, either the pieces of paper that you'll, uh, you probably have in your bulletin, or um, on the Bible app, if you're on the Bible app, if you go to columbiagrove.org, just swipe right twice, and you'll get to the message notes throughout the week there. Um, and uh, I just wanted to start it off. I know uh, John led us in prayer so well. I just want to lead us in one brief prayer before we dive into the Word again. Because see, as we open up the Word of God, my prayer is, is twofold. One is that you'd be praying that you would hear something today that will strengthen your walk. And secondly, secondly, that um, you would hear something today that would equip you to share God's message of grace with somebody else. And you probably have somebody on your heart that, that you're already thinking, I, 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 I hope, God, that you will equip me today and give me an opportunity to share God's grace with someone. So let's just bow our heads just for a moment before we dive in. Lord, we just pray that this morning, just as you promised to meet us in your word, just help our hearts to be open. Help each one of us to be ready to hear from you today. And Lord, we pray not only that you would fill us, but God, that you would equip us so that our lives could be ambassadors, faithful ambassadors of grace to the world around us. And, and uh, if you've got somebody especially in mind, just take a moment and just whisper their name before the Lord. Just take a moment. Okay. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's get into it. Now, who here has ever met a young couple that's getting married and you just thought, do they really know what they're getting themselves into? <laughs> Ever had a situation like that? Who here knows somebody who's married or wants to be married or was once married? Or anybody know anybody like, like, like that? Anybody know someone who's married? I'm just going to see if I can get you to raise your hand for anything. Um, <laughs> apparently not. Some of, some of, anyways. Now, one of the reasons why it's true that, you know, when a couple's getting married, you just think, oh, do they really know what they're getting themselves into? Is the, the reason why we think that is because they don't. <laughs> because a marriage and what happens in a wedding ceremony is, so in, is just so profound. Just, just think about that. I mean, even, even if, you're, if your wedding is in Vegas before an Elvis impersonator... There's all these things going on. I'm, I'm not judging. I'm just, I, I just heard, you know. If, even, even if that's what you're doing, even if that's how you got married and you're, and you're, and you're, and you're you know, your bridal party's still hung over, there's, there's still super significant stuff happening in that moment. I mean, in the moment when, when a, a marriage happens, there is a legal change. I mean, because the government sees them differently, right? There's a relational change. Because now the, the couple has made a different, um, a different kind of commitment to one another. So there's a relational and an emotional change, different kind of commitment from the we're trying this out to we're working this out. That's the difference. There's the relational change of now you, you've got all this other family. Some of you didn't factor that in, did you? But you've got all this other family that's family now. That's a relational change. Other, there's all these weird people in your life, and they're family. There's also financial. Here's the merging of, of, of assets. There's the physical, and that's the sexual elements. Yay, God. But there's also, you know, just the doing life together. That's the, the, like, you know, the sharing the same tube of toothpaste and, and trying to convince the other person that the toilet paper roll is supposed to go over the top. I mean, that's just the right way to do it. <clears throat> so there's all these things you got to figure out, you know, all these different layers that are happening here, and there's a and there's a spiritual layer too. I mean, even in some traditions, I mean, marriage is considered a sacrament. It's sacramental. There's something inherently sacred about marriage, and it's all happening all at once. Even if you're even if you're getting married before that Elvis impersonator. It's, it's still simultaneously true, and it takes a lifetime to discover just how true it is and how much is going on. I only bring up that illustration to, to, to make this one point, is what we're going to be talking about today is what happens in, and, or more specifically, what happened in the death and resurrection of Jesus. It is this, this event so incredibly profound that even in the moment as people were experiencing it and witnessing it, it took a lifetime and, and beyond to even understand, begin to understand just how incredibly significant that event was. 
because I want to equip you to understand it better, okay? See, the, the Bible uh, proclaims the death and resurrection of Jesus to be the pivotal point in human history. The, the moment where the creator entered creation and redeemed it. And, and so it, it is, it's incredibly significant. Which is why it's so important that we get a better understanding of what's going on in those, in those places. And here's why. Because, see, when we're murky about what was accomplished for us through Jesus in his death and resurrection, when we're murky about that, and I believe a lot of us are. I mean, because, you know, if you ask the average Christian, how are you saved? They may go, through Jesus. Yeah, okay, got it. By grace. Yep, got it. How? Ooh, uh, through Jesus? <laughs> how? It was just, we have a hard time going into the detail. We get murky about it. We get murky about it, which means that when life gets tough, we get murky on some really fundamental questions like this one. So does God really love me? Now, when I'm feeling good about God, oh, yeah, that's awesome. But see, all of us, you're going to, all of us, we go through times of disappointment. We go through discouragement. Sometimes we go through depression. And so our feelings, they're just going to betray us. Like, and so we can't, we can't feel it anymore. We can't sense it from the world around us. If God loves me, then why are things going so badly? Or we start looking at our own souls and going, I don't love me. So how in the world could God ever love me? So we get murky on this stuff. Does God really love me? When we're murky on what happened when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. So what we're going to be talking about today is the doctrine of the atonement. Doctrine of the atonement. Okay, here, here's a working definition of that. The doctrine of the, of the atonement is, is this. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, we were made right with God. That's the doctrine of the atonement. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, you and I, we were made right with God. And here's a way to remember it. It's, atonement is like at one minute. We were separated, but now we have been reunited. The atonement... Now, just a little bit of review. We're going to jump into what we talked about last week. Here's the first thing we need to know about the atonement, is that we need it. We need it. You know, Ephesians um, chapter 2, verse 2 talks about how, how all of us, we, we, our tendency is to gratify the cravings of our flesh and follow its desires and thoughts. The, the, the human condition is one that inherently bends toward selfishness. We tend to think of ourselves and our own needs and our own wants first. Now, that manifests itself in the big stuff, you know, the, the things that are, you know, like we pass laws against. It also manifests itself, itself in, in the small things, what I would like to think of as like the small things that actually are the big thing. That we just generally live out of relationship with God. Like, I mean, even as Christians, even as Christians, our, our, our predisposition is towards sin. I'll, I'll give you a little, a little example. Like, if there, was a, if there was a chalk mark made on a blackboard, every time you went for more than five minutes in a day without thinking anything about God and God's goodness or God's desires for your life or any, any part of your day, like where God was just not part of your thought process at all, if there was a chalk mark made every day for every time more than five minutes passed where God was not on your mind whatsoever. If you're like me, you'd have a lot of chalk marks on the board every single day. We live out of... We were created for active, active intimate communion with God, but we, we don't live like that. You know, it's, it's like we're airplanes that have repurposed ourselves as wheelbarrows. You know, and never, never taken to the air, and you wonder why so many people are so frustrated so much of the time. We were created for intimate communion with God, intimate relationship with God, and much of the time, we, we were, God's just not even on our minds at all. That's the truth. Even, even for those of us who, who, who know God on some level. 
You know, we're toasters that don't toast. We're airplanes that don't fly. Race cars that have never gotten on the road or barely get on the road at all. Which is why, as we, as we consider the topic of the atonement, we recognize that all of us are by nature objects of God's wrath. That the good God of the universe, wanting the universe to be good, has a fierce desire to set things right. You know, the, the, the same anger that you and I and we feel about the injustices in the world, and there are so many, aren't there? That God feels that too. And God takes even a personal responsibility for that. I want to, he has a fierce desire to set things right. But like last week, we talked about God's dilemma. You see, as much as we rail against God and say, God, well, why don't you, why don't you eradicate all the sin in the world? Why can't you just take care of that stuff? Why can't fire just fall from heaven every time, you know, somebody does something bad? But the problem is, if, if, that, was, if, if that really happened, you and I and we would be eradicated. Do you understand that? When we're praying to God to for God to eradicate sin in the world, we, we are asking God on some level to, to destroy us. So that's God's dilemma. Do I destroy humanity or do I eradicate sin? Which is why the gospel is so amazing. That the God of the universe, the creator of the entire universe would come up with this incredible, incredible solution. And that's grace. That's the atonement. That God would take personal responsibility for our sin. He would take personal responsibility for making those wrong things right. And so that's what we're going to talk about. That, that we, we deserve God's wrath. And, and let's go back just one slide, please. And so let's, let's just say this before we... Uh, in between. There we go. I deserve wrath. Will you say that with me? I deserve wrath. I deserve wrath. But that's not what God gives me. So under the doctrine of the atonement, the doctrine of the atonement, you know, this, this great idea that through Jesus' death and resurrection, we're made right with God. There are... Um, there, at least three categories of kind of biblical theories that help us to understand what's going on there. And I want to walk us through that. Now, my, my, my goal today isn't just to be kind of teaching and, yeah, we're going we're gonna to walk through some doctrine, but hang with me, okay? I want to strengthen your head to strengthen your heart, to strengthen your feet, to strengthen your, your, your walk, okay? So, so of, the, of the doctrines of the atonement, here's, here's one of the, the first ones, that Jesus is my substitute. Jesus is my substitute. In, in um, Christian theology, that's sometimes called penal substitution or the satisfaction theory. This idea that Jesus suffered God's wrath for us, meeting the demands of justice. Say that with me. Jesus suffered God's wrath for us, meeting the demands of justice. Now, we see that in the scriptures, in, in passages like Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. In him... We have redemption, how? Through his blood. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished on us. Or, sorry about that. 2 Corinthians or five, verse, verse five, uh, chapter 5, verse 21. And God made him who had no sin to be what? Sin for us. Sin for us. For us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Or Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. How many of our sins? All of them. All of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. Our legal indebtedness was stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Here's an illustration that might help. Imagine that you have accumulated a billion dollars in parking tickets. 
Who here would have the capacity to pay off a billion dollars in parking tickets? N none of us. I, that was my assumption. Otherwise, we we're about to do a message on tithing. But, um, <laughs> but none of us, none of us, none of us, none of us would have the capacity to pay off a billion dollars of parking tickets. Now, let's imagine one more layer to that. Imagine that if you have a lifetime of unpaid parking tickets, you're going to be put to death. Now, at that moment, you are, you're, just, you're pretty much hosed, aren't you? There's nothing you can do. You are absolutely condemned because you've accumulated a, a massive parking tickets that can never be repaid. The only way out is if somebody else pays it for you. That's what's being discussed here in this idea of penal substitution. That there is a debt. We have a, an ethical, moral debt to God because of our sin. You know, the sin nature that we inherited, but also the, the ongoing sin of our lives. The big things, but also the little things. That lifetime of, of ignoring God and, it, and, and all of the effects of what it means to be living fundamentally for ourselves. It accumulates this huge, unpayable debt that... That on the cross, Jesus took on all of human sin, all of the penalty of all of the wrongdoing of all of us, including you and me. And he paid for it once and for all. That's penal substitution. That's, 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 the, that's one aspect of the doctrine of the atonement. So that because of Jesus... My sins are completely forgiven. Say that with me. Because of Jesus, my sins are what? Complete. Do you believe that? Well, you better say it like you do. Because of Jesus, my sins are completely forgiven. That's one aspect of the doctrine of the atonement. That your, your and my legal indebtedness to God has been completely paid for by Jesus. Here's the second aspect. Is that Jesus won the victory for me. This in, in Christian theology is called Christus Victor or sometimes ransom theory. This idea that Jesus conquered sin and death for us, freeing us from the power of evil and the power of the devil. That because we live in a corrupt, fallen world, there's evil everywhere. Because the wages of sin is death, and all of us have sinned, we, we have earned our own demise. We've earned our own death. We are trapped in that future, so to speak. But by, by having one sinless person take on death for us, he broke the power, fundamentally broke the power of death, not only in that singular instance, but broke the power of death everywhere. That he's the exception that makes the new rule, so to speak. If the wages of sin is death and you have one sinless person die and then rise again, that power of death has been broken. Um, we see this throughout the scriptures. Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave himself for our sins to, what's the word? Rescue us from this present age according to the will of our God and Father. Or Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might what? Break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and what? Free us, or, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Or maybe you could, here's another way to expand that metaphor. Imagine you and we, we we're, we're, you and I, we're in a prison. You know, death, evil is a prison. We're imprisoned by it. There's no way out until one day somebody from outside the prison tunnels into the prison and then kicks one of the walls down and walks out. 
That's a good illustration of what Christ accomplished on the cross for us. He entered the prison of death and then destroyed it by walking out of the prison. Like, so we may still be in that, in that prison cell, but there's a wall missing. And all we need to do to get out of the prison cell is follow the one who broke down the wall. Does that make sense? See, that's also why every recovery group that has been successful has a, as, it, as, as its starting point, calling out to a higher power. Because when we are trapped in our own sin, we need somebody to break us out. And the good news of the gospel is that Jesus has done that for you. He has accomplished that already. So here's what I hope we could say together, a little phrase. Because of Jesus, sin and its effects no longer imprison me. Will you say that with me? Because of Jesus, sin and its effects no longer imprison me. Do you believe it? That's the second aspect of the doctrine of the atonement. Here's a third. is the idea that Jesus fundamentally changed humankind. So in Christian theology, that's sometimes referred to as the recapitulation theory. Okay, here's the idea. Is that Jesus represented all humanity and so therefore changed humanity's relationship with God through his obedience. That Jesus, it's, it's like Jesus is the new Adam or if we're really getting technical, the new Adam and Eve. So there are new, he's our new representative before God. We, we see this um, unpacked in Romans chapter 5, uh, verses 14 through 17 and beyond. But listen, we're just going to go through 14 through 17. Nevertheless, Paul writes to the church in Rome, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if many died because of the trespass of one man, that's Adam, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin, and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Jesus becomes our new representative before God. Do you hear that? So let's try this phrase out together. Because of Jesus, God sees me as his holy, righteous, sinless child. Let's say that together. Because of Jesus, God sees me as his holy, righteous, sinless child. Because Jesus was your and my and our representative before God. He broke the mold of sinful humanity and replaced it with a prototype of obedient humanity. Jesus shows us and showed, and showed us and shows us how to be fully and completely human. And Jesus brings humanity back into relationship with God. That's the doctrine of the atonement. And, and here's what I want you to understand, too. You see, that, that these are things that have already been accomplished for you. They've already been accomplished for you. Jesus has already paid the penalty for your sin. Jesus has already conquered sin and death for you. Jesus has already called you to be his child. That when God looks at you, he sees, he sees the sacrifice of Jesus over you. When he looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus on you. That Jesus on the cross fundamentally changed humanity's relationship with God. Plus, you have the element of, of, of the Holy Spirit living inside you. Do you realize that when you pray and you're asking God to, to move in your life and, and fill your heart, you have 
inside of you an absolutely endless source of wisdom, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Do you realize that? That if your heart belongs to Jesus and the Holy Spirit lives in your life, that is available to you. He changes us from the inside out. And this has a number of, uh, of um, important implications. I'm just going to riff on a couple of them here. First thing is a sense of identity. Who are you? Who are you? One of the things I think is just so weird is, it, is the experiment we've been doing for the last 20 years in our culture about identity. We, we, we tell our children, or you know, social media and the culture, and it tells our children, you've got to figure out who you are for yourself. Don't let anybody else tell you who you are. You heard that line? You got to figure it out for yourself. What a horrible thing to do to a child. They can barely tie their shoes and they can't balance a checkbook yet, but they're supposed to figure out all by themselves who they are. That's nuts. That's nuts. But see, passages like this, they tell us who we are. Do you know who you are? You're a child of God. You're redeemed, by a, redeemed at a price. You were, God was planning for your life before the very foundations of the earth. He loved you so much that he bled and died on the cross, that he rose again from the dead so that you could have relationship with him. He knows every hair on your head. He knows every thought in your mind. He has plans for every single day of your life. You matter to him. That is your identity. We have got to tell the next generation that. That's one among many reasons why we got to take really seriously the hypocrisy of this generation. Because if we're not living the gospel, if we're not grounding our lives in the gospel, we are one generation away. Not, not only from a godless America, which is, seems like we're on a fast track to that, But if the people you love in your life the most, not knowing the greatest source of peace and joy and hope, the doctrine of the atonement, it changes how we relate on the bad days, when we're feeling down, you know? Because we remember what Christ has already done for us. Because you're going to face disappointment. You're going to face discouragement. You might face depression. There's going to be days, many days perhaps, when your feelings will betray you. And your heart all by itself won't be anchored in the truth. So we need to anchor our hearts in this greater reality of what Jesus has already done. Do you, do you hear me? Do you hear me? It changes how we pray. <laughs> you know, it gets us away from those self-absorbed, entitled prayers. You ever, you ever experience something a little bit like, because you realize when, when, when we forget what God has already done for us, it, it makes our prayers just absolutely wacky. It's like we're saying to the Lord, can I see your eyes? Can you see your eyes? Okay. It's like we say to the Lord, hey, Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thanks for, for paying everything so my sins could be forgiven. Thanks for conquering sin and death so that I never, ever, ever, ever need to fear hell and I don't need to even fear death itself. Thanks for doing that for me. Thanks for adopting me into your family and making me your child. Thanks for giving everything so that's possible. But really, what have you done for me lately? Because, you know, I'm a little bit behind on my car payment and I'm kind of bummed out about that. So if you, don't, if, you don't, if you don't get on it, Lord, I am not going to believe in you. Now, I illustrate that with, with sarcasm. But, but we do that to God, don't we? When we forget what he's already done, we forget when he's already done. I think maybe, it, maybe it'd be good every now and again, you know, to have, the, have like a Catholic crucifix up on your wall, you know, where Jesus is still on the cross. So every time you're having a whiny day and you, Jesus, you haven't done very much for me recently, you can look at the wall and go, oh yeah, there was that. There was that one thing. Because if we're responding to the love of God in our life, 
and I hope that we would do that. Here's the, here's the challenge. Can I get just, just down just a tiny little bit? So here's my challenge to you. Because as we hear about the atonement, it should draw us into worship. It should draw us into gratitude. So my challenge for you this week is spend at least five minutes by the, by the end of the day thanking God that, he is, that, that through Jesus your sins are paid for. That through Jesus he has conquered death on your behalf. And that he's made you your child. Made, made you his child. There we go. It should draw us into worship. It should draw us into obedience. It should draw us into wanting to spend time with God who loves you so much. Do you realize how much God loves you? So let's start there with a couple of minutes of doing just that. Would you bow your heads with me? Oh, Jesus, thank you that you paid for my sin. Take a moment, a couple moments just under your breath, just thanking God for that. Thank you, Jesus, that you conquered sin and death on my behalf. Just take a couple moments, just thanking God under your breath. Thank you, God, that you made me your child. Just take a moment, just thanking him for that. 